There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean Breeze Books. Welcome back to my channel and another Freddy Reads. And the first, I'm pretty sure this is right, the first possibly only Al Fresco Friday Reads of 2024. There is no better indication of how uh, b how much back to full health I feel than the fact that I had enough energy to uh, gleefully leave the house today on a mild late f September Friday to walk good 10, 15 minutes to a park, plunk myself down and talk to you Al fresco. I am absolutely overjoyed because like I say it speaks volumes to how much back in the saddle I feel. When I arrived five minutes ago there was nobody in the little playground beside me and school is just getting out at 227 so maybe it's recess. With this particular mic I don't think it's gonna pick up any or very much of the background noise so I should be okay. I have had a fabulous reading week and in terms of news, oh, I went for a pedicure with my mom on Tuesday morning, and that was lovely. Boy, my feet were pretty crunchy and brittle and in need of some love. And the chair that I sat in was a full massage chair, so it gave me the most lovely massage. The massage was worth the price of everything, so I was quite happy with that. And bookish news. Yesterday was a fabulous day. I went out for lunch with my dear friend Gwen, and she and I hadn't seen each other for about six weeks. And we talked about many things, but one of them was books, and she raved about Denison Avenue, which I think won the that silly CBC reality TV thing, which is so embarrassing that Canada has that. But I think it won. It was in the running anyway. And I know Lindy is a fan of that book. It's about a elderly Chinese woman in Toronto and Gwen just raved about it so I have to get to that one and then I went out for an early dinner with Sharon Butala and then we went to a book launch mom joined us she couldn't come for the early dinner she had planned to and it didn't work out but she made it for the reading and this was the launch of a, of a book of essays by Guy Vanderhaeg Saskatoon's maybe most famous writer because somebody asked me to, Observations on History, Literature, and the Passing Scene, Guy Vanderhaeg, I believe he's won the Governor General's Award, I'm pretty sure at least twice, possibly three times. Maybe the third time was just nominated. The event was packed, and all the Saskatoon literati were there. I enjoyed myself immensely. Didn't feel like waiting in line for the, um, can I help you? Yeah, can I help you? No. <laughs> I'm just making a video. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I'm just having a recess. No problem. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yep. That was very strange. That man came up to me and he had a, a Tupperware container full of fruit and salary. And he kept looking at me and I thought he wanted to sit down. This is the only picnic table in the park. And he kept coming over, kind of smiling, but staring at me curiously. So that's when I said, can I help you? And uh, he said, can I help you? I said, no. <laughs> so he said, I'm just here, it's just recess. Well, this is not a school park. There's a school right there, but this is not a school park. This is a public park, so I don't think I'm breaking any laws. <laughs> um, he read from a couple of these essays. Some of them were funny, some of them were political in a literary way, and uh, I look forward to, to diving into them. I really enjoyed the event. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler about next week's Mr. Guest because she was there. I had taped her mystery chat the day before, and then she was there. So that's a little bit of a spoiler for next week, but not much. All right, without further ado, this was an absolutely incredible get for my mystery guest this week. And I am embarrassed, and I look embarrassed and flustered at the very beginning of the video because I had a real struggle that never su reached success in pronouncing this Mr. Guest's name. I'm very lucky that they were very understanding and I soon calmed down but that explains the how flustered I was for the first minute or whatever. Let's go meet this person.
And this week's mystery guest, I am delighted to meet for the first time the uh, Bengali translator and anthologist and professor of creative writing, Arunava Sinha. Ar Arunava, welcome to my channel. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for having me. And uh, he's joining us from Delhi. I apologize for all the things I'm going to mispronounce, and I hope you will feel very comfortable to correct me. Uh, why don't you say your own name for us so that people can hear how it should be pronounced? Well, if I was speaking to a Bangla-speaking person, they'd probably address me as Orunabho. And elsewhere in India and some parts of the world, if they're familiar enough, they'll try Arunava. And Arun then there are many variations after Great. that. I hope I uh, make up in my enthusiasm for what I um, am so incompetent at, which is my pronunciation. <laughs> so really, really oh, great no. to talk to you. Please don't worry about that. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. I'm fishing for, for uh, an affirmation there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Arunava came onto my radar. Um, and then I realized how much of his other books I have, particularly on ebook. But I am maybe 75% through this massive tome, Kwab Nava, by uh, the Bangladeshi writer Aktu Ruzaman Ilias. Have I got that right, Ilias? Close enough. A tra and, which you translated, and I am buddy reading this with my dear friend Joe. She has a deep interest in literature from this part of the world, and we are really enjoying it. It's giving us a fabulous headache, and I wonder if we might get started by you kind of introducing the novel. So, uh, Akhtaru Zaman Elias wrote only two novels in his entire life, and one book of short stories, and his entire reputation is built on these three books, as it were or reputation as a writer of fiction, that is, because he was also a professor of literature. And he wrote in the country of Bangladesh, which, as you know, was born in 1971 after uh, securing independence from Pakistan. It was earlier East Pakistan, which was one of the two enclaves that were created when uh, the subcontinent of India was partitioned in 1947 at the time that the British left and granted independence to the entire area and two countries were formed. The countries were created on the basis of religious majority, which was demanded by uh, Muhammad Jinnah, who wanted a separate state for Muslims. So mm, the areas that were most dense in terms of the Muslim population that was into the Northwest and to the East were carved out as separate countries, a single country, but with two separate wings. West Pakistan and East Pakistan. Culturally, they were as different from each other as chalk and cheese. Uh, in West Pakistan, for example, people speak mostly Urdu. In East Pakistan, people speak almost entirely Bangla, which is also the language of the state of West Bengal where I come from. So it was what was called undivided Bengal initially. And then it was carved into West and East Bengal. And East Bengal became East Pakistan. And Almost immediately after this independence slash partition, there began a language movement in, in East Pakistan because Urdu was being imposed by the rulers in West Pakistan, who were, which is where the capital city was. And Bangla speaking people resisted this. And there was a language movement, which is called the Bhasha Andolan, which actually led to uh, the police uh, firing on the protesters and um, approximately four students were killed. And this took place on the 21st of February in the early 1950s. And since then, that day has been designated International Mother Language Day by the UN. It's mm -hmm. called uh, Ekushe, Amor Ekushe, the immortal 21st. And so Bangla has been at the heart of this part of, the, uh, of South Asia right from the beginning. And eventually, when the independent movement came in the late 1960s, and eventually culminated in um, in the creation of Bangladesh with military support from India, I might add, who were not exactly on the best of terms with Pakistan then, as they are not now. The language became the, the cultural and political fulcrum of the country, which is why it's called Bangladesh. It's arguably the only country in the world which is named after its language. And Desh means land. So it's the land of Bangla. And Dr. Uzzaman Elias was... Um, he wrote after Bangladesh was created, so he wrote in the 1990s mainly, but he was born in pre-independence 
um, what was still India at that point, then lived and grew up and lived through uh, East Pakistan. And then finally, he was a writer in Bangladesh. And as you can tell from the book, he was a highly literary writer, but he was also deeply steeped in the in uh, historical consciousness of what was going on in his own land, not just going back to the freedom movement, which has been the basis of a huge amount of literature from independent Bangladesh. But he looked back further, both into the partition, as well as going even further to all kinds of political movements, as well as acts of revolt against the British. And all of these featured in this, which is his second novel, Khwab Nama, The Book of Dreams. His first novel was titled uh, Chile Kota Shepai, which loosely might translate into The God in, in the Attic. And that is actually more closely related to the independence movement in Bangladesh, what came before and after. But this one looks at the original independence movement of 1947, what came before and after. With it, he fuses the political movement for land, which was led by communist forces. He fuses a long history of the country, which where it's very hard to tell where actual events end and where memories and the imagination takes over. And it's a continuum, really. So there's no hard uh, boundary between these two. And he fuses all of this together into, as you know, most remarkable narrative. Absolutely. I don't think I can claim it as an original term or anything, but I often talk about uh, an imperfect reading where I uh, tackle a literary text that is really complex, that's perhaps about a culture that I'm not familiar with. And I do a lot of Google reading and, you know, as looking stuff up as much as I can. But I realize that I'm probably not getting it the way somebody from that part of the world would get it. But I'm getting a lot out of it. And I'm sure as heck getting a lot out of Kwabnama uh, now that I'm nearing the end. And I wonder if you might say a little bit more about the book by t- introducing us to maybe three characters, if that's the right word. One would be Munchi, uh, the other would be Sherag Ali, and the other would be Tamaz's father. How's that for a, a setup? Sherag Ali is, in a sense, the heart and soul of the book because he is dead, but he is present right through. And um, his great skill was that he could... Um, he had this book, literally the book called Khwab Nama, which was a book of dreams, which, which he used to interpret people's dreams. And it's a book that clearly seems to have some kind of, if not magical properties, certainly properties that will bring to its current owner some sort of pause that the others don't have. And so this book becomes, in a sense, not exactly a subject of dispute, but certainly a um, fair amount of conflict among the characters. And Chirag Ali makes his appearance both as memory, remember the way he is remembered, as well as sometimes he appears to be there in person, maybe channeled through others or not. And it's never very clear because, um, you know, in, in this novel, you can never quite tell what the canvas of reality includes. And you really have to read all of it as reality. And, and the idea, I think, is that reality is not necessarily what is happening out there in the objective world, but also the way it is being mapped in the heads of the people who inhabit this novel. And therefore, if they see it and if they think it and they hear it, then it's real. It's not as though they consider themselves as having hallucinations or anything. Tamiz's father, who actually has no name, as you can tell, Tamiz Bap in the Bangla version, is um, the inheritor of the Book of Dreams because he married uh, Kulsum, who is Chiragali's granddaughter. Yes. So he is. He also gets this book, but he seems to be the strangest character over here because he dreams of an old historical figure who who rebelled against the British and who was riddled with bullets and supposedly took up his residence in a fig tree thereafter and and looks over the entire area and acts as his guardian angel. And he wants to be in communion with this figure. So every now and then he starts sleepwalking and he goes up to there and he tries to meet this guy and all kinds of things happen to him without his actually initiating much of it. And he also has this phenomenal appetite. He can put away food like nobody's business. 
and you can clearly see the the symbolism there how closely that is linked this hunger becomes um, is is a communal hunger and which is very closely linked to the exploitation of the peasants who did not own the land that they farmed and who in the in one of the political tracks in this novel are demanding a two thirds share of the crops that they harvest uh, instead it's of the, the half and half the tabaga movement there's the tabaga movement so te is three and bhaga is share so the idea is the whole harvest should be split into three and that the peasant should get two and the owner of the land one which they feel is the fairer division of the spoils but of course that was not the case and uh, india had this whole system called the zamindari system which was uh, sanctioned by the british which allowed people with some amount of money to own large tracts of land and for which they paid taxes to the british rulers and in turn they extracted taxes from the peasants whom they allowed to cultivate their land so it was all a finely designed system to uh, exploit the poor and keep them poor and perhaps make them poorer still so that whole community historically is represented here in this novel and they come into play the third person you mentioned is munshi that's munshi barkatullah shah munshi barkatullah shah is the person i just spoke about whom tamiz's father or tamiz's bap wants to be in communion with and he is the figure that hovers over the entire area where this novel is set and he is a figure that is both well that's everything that's guardian angel that's inspiration and a figure who has never quite left and he seems to be certainly most present or uh, has the deepest impact on Tamiz's father yes um, but other people believe in him whether they've seen him or not but maybe not everybody believes in him and then that kind of shifts throughout the novel we won't give anything away but fascinating so what if anything do you think people who are not familiar with the literature and history of this part of the world might read in preparation for tackling quabnama that's a great question and i'm just trying to think of what might be useful i can't really think of anything i mean i think you need to read quabnama to <laughs> prepare for quabnama and give it a second reading after the first one but i suppose even something as basic as a wikipedia history of bangladesh well would, and i've been consulting all of that stuff and and i have a character list and i have a key concepts list with the jotadar and jo uh, Jomandar and all that stuff, Tembaga movement, and it's been a profoundly educational process with a rich literary, obviously a rich literary nuance. So, so thank you for bringing it into the into English. Thank you for giving it all this love and enthusiasm. Tell us about some of your most recent. You have eighty-seven translations to your name, which is incredible. So tell us about yeah some of the the most recent or. Uh, soon to come out uh, translations that you've finished among the recent ones are of course it's it's inevitably a very wide variety of books and all of them almost all of them are fiction i'm going to first talk about a novel that came out last year it's a slim novel titled hospital it is written also by a writer of bangladeshi origin but who lives in australia yes and it's sanya rushdi and sanya writes um, about her own experiences as someone who has gone through severe attacks of schizoid um, paranoia and she writes very calmly about particular episode in her life where she has to um, first go from her home to a kind of half a house and then eventually she has to go into an institution and through extraordinary lucidity she describes that entire movement from her home to the hospital and finally out of it and while there is an argument in the book that it's not medication but conversation that can actually help fix such problems which is which is fascinating in its own right but it's really a very calm and therefore chilling look at at how a person intersects with the with the world the way the rest of us see it and a person with her condition sees it and it is not meant to evoke uh, you know sympathy or compassion or any of those things it is just meant to give us clarity it is meant to give us clarity to an alternative world view that is perfectly consistent within itself 
and which at the end of it, you would really hesitate to even label as being abnormal in any way. It's as normal as your worldview and mine. Uh, and who are we to say that ours is exactly congruent with what the majority of, of the people see anyway? I'm, I'm sure Akhtaru Zaman Elias did not see the world the way you and I did. Otherwise, he would not have been able to write this book. And that goes for someone like Sanya as well. So it's an incredibly... Uh, it was a book that I read 10 pages of and I decided right away that I was going to translate it. And it has a lovely cover in the Australian edition and I can't yes. find it outside of Australia. Uh, I think it's all, uh, now out from Seagull Books as well. And yes. they always have beautiful covers, but I want the Australian version. I know. My Australian and friends. That, to... That's Sanya's own drawing, by the way. Oh, no, no, I didn't realize that. That's yes, fabulous. yes, yes. Yeah. And it also, the same drawing also appeared in the cover of the original Bangla edition, but yeah. the Giromondo art director cropped it in a much more interesting way. So I think it becomes much more intense. Look, gorgeous image. And that's uh, now I want to, uh, now I'm coveting it even more now that I know it's an uh, illustration by the author. Yes, I can imagine. This is a scene of students coming down a library staircase. Sounds fabulous. Maybe there's one more novel I'd like to talk about. It's called A Touch of Salt. It's written by the uh, Bengali writer Anita Agnihotri. What she does here is that, and here again, there's some historical context. In the western state of Gujarat, there is this area called the Ran of Kutch, which actually is now land, but it's marshy salt land. It's salt land because they used to be, the sea used to be there before it went away and left some land. But it is, as you can imagine, because the sea was there, it's dense with salt. And um, at the time that the British ruled India, it provided nearly 90% of the salt consumed in India. And there is one community, which is not a religious community, because there are both Hindus and Muslims among them, called the Agadias, who farm salt over there. And we have the strangest life because they live in villages and then they go out to these salt pans, which are in the marshes, and they spend eight months a year there, just basically stomping on the salt in order to make it rise to the surface of the water so that it can then be pulled out and farmed, as it were. And one of the side effects of this is that their legs are, are so full of salt because they're, they stand there immersed up to their knees or even higher in salt water that when they die, and as you know, uh, Hindus are cremated after their death, but their legs are so full of salt that their legs don't burn. Um, I mean, that's that's one of the one of the interesting side effects, as it were. So wow. what this novel does is it takes two periods in India's history, one from the time that Mahatma Gandhi led a salt, what's called a salt march as a protest movement against the British rulers, because the British had issued an edict or a series of edicts saying that one, Indians would not be allowed to manufacture salt anymore. It would all be done by British companies, which meant that British companies came in and purchased the salt that the Agadias used to make. And two, that Indians would also have to pay a large tax on any salt they bought. And because many very poor Indians only ate rice and salt, this meant that even the most basic food for the poorest of Indians suddenly became extraordinarily expensive. So Gandhi led this symbolic march which ended at the seaside village of Dandi, where he picked up a handful of salt from the sea and said, here we are manufacturing salt and we are breaking the law. And this marks the beginning of our movement against the British asking them to leave India. And so what Anita Agniyoti does in this novel is that she takes a fictional character from this Agadia community and makes him join Gandhi's marches. There is, There was no such history, hasn't recorded any such person. And so we get a view of Gandhi's salt march with this 15-year-old Agaria figure in there. And this alternates with the present day when the same person's grandson, whose name is Azad, which means freedom, is leading a movement against the corporatization now of salt manufacture to a point where the salt makers themselves are left out of the equation completely. So these are two parallel protest movements one in pre-independent India and one in independent India in the current time, both centered around salt. A fictional family is the Fulcrum 
for the action that takes place. So Anita writes this very remarkably. Her, her novels are often part anthropology, part history, and part fiction. So it's it qu- quite redefines what fiction is. It's it's no longer the kind that we we were used to in the classic form. But it's very powerful and it makes a deep impact. That one might be hard to get outside India. I'm just looking it up. but uh, At the moment, yes. It's only just about come out in India. I see. So it'll come out here eventually. Yes, I hope so. I also have a, uh, your anthology, or maybe it's one of your anthologies, The Greatest Indian Stories Ever Told. You edited uh, 50 masterpieces from the 19th century to the present. Going to be reading this next year. Um, tell us a little bit about this. Sure. So this one's a sort of an anthology of anthologies in the sense that uh, the Aleph Book Company uh, has produced this series now, I think, running into 12 or 13 books of short stories from each of the non-English Indian languages translated into English. And they're all called the greatest da da da. So there's uh, the first one in the series was the greatest Bengali stories ever told. Oh, yes, which, yes, yes. which which I uh, put together. And then we, we've had progressively Urdu, Hindi, Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, Odia, Kannada, Gujarati, Marathi, and so on. And this one was uh, their publisher, David Davida's idea that, you know, while not everybody will probably buy and read every one of these titles, why don't we give them a selection from each of them? And also a very... Good entry point for anyone who has not read anything from this part of the world and may find it easier to start with short stories. It's less of an investment in terms of time. And also you get much more variety rather than um, being locked into one writer. That was how this book came about. So putting this anthology together was fantastic because I actually ended up reading some uh, 250 stories to pick 50, which is actually not too difficult. One out of five is... Not too bad. Right. <laughs> as the strike rate goes. I mean, you know, it's easier to say no if you know what I mean. It was, it's heartbreaking, but uh, there it is. So that's how this book came about. I can't wait to dive in. So this is a basic question, but it's a question that I'm very curious about. Uh, how did you become a translator? How does one become a translator? Why are you a translator and not, uh, I don't know, a, a novelist or a, a plumber? <laughs> so, you know, every translator will give you almost the same answer, which is that they just stumbled upon this line of work. It, it no, Nowadays, maybe people plan to be translators, certainly not when I started out. For me, what happened was that I was in college when Gabriel Garcia Marquez won the Nobel Prize. And Picador brought out these beautiful editions of his works, including 100 Years of Solitude. And when I read it for the first time, I realized that this book was actually not written in English. Although we'd all read loads of translated books before that, but somehow the penny dropped. And then the realization that, so therefore there is a separate process involved in translating. So what's it like? And as a student of literature, I thought the best way to find out is to try it for myself. So that was how I started. And then opportunities came because we started a magazine in Calcutta and we used to publish one short story in translation every month. So that was how it became a little bit of a practice. But all the books that I did came only about 15 years afterwards. And and then you never look back, or I don't think you even took a breath. 87 translations (laughs) to your your name. And you also translate English literature, English fiction into Bengali. Um, Is that, obviously, that's a different way. That's a different, you're going from your second language to your to your first, I'm assuming first, um, but a- any comments on how that's different or uh, especially challenging or um, rewarding in a different way? Well, you know, to begin with the legacies of colonial education, as well as um, missionary schools run by Jesuits, actually ensure that English is not even really um, the second language for our genera- for many of our generation. It's a sort of co-first language, as it were. While we, while Bangla was the first language or Hindi or Tamil or Telugu that we heard as babies, but we segued into English very quickly and stayed there. And so much so that, in fact, most many of us actually wrote everything in English. We seldom wrote in our mother tongue, although we spoke it and read it and continue to do so. So when I had done a fair amount of books, uh, when I translated them into English, I felt the urge both to push the envelope and to 
kind of give something back to my own language. So that was how this whole business began of translating into Bangla. And then I realized when doing it that I do not write Bangla. I've never written Bangla really except in school. So I translate in my head first. So it's almost an oral process where I compose the entire sentence in my head and I record it sometimes and then I transcribe it. Or nowadays you have speech to text. So a very rough first draft comes directly by dictating the translation into the computer and seeing a text at the end of it, which has actually been very rewarding because I think when you're speaking a language, you unlock a different part of your brain and your vocabulary changes. Uh, writing, translating a lot, writing a lot also means that your muscles for using certain words get stronger. But when you're speaking, you have more variety. At least that's what I've found. So in some ways, while translating into Bangla is a much slower process, it is a much more rewarding one, or at least as rewarding one for me. Give us a couple titles that you've translated from English into Okay, Bang. so I've translated Amitav Ghosh's novel, Gun Island, into Bangla. And mm -hmm. uh, two other novels that I've translated uh, are both from the English translations rather than from the original languages, because they're from Kannada and Tamil, respectively. Uh, the Kannada novel is Ghachar Ghochar, written by Vivek Shanbagh. I love that yeah. novel so much. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. so I use both the English and the Hindi versions to translate into Bangla. And likewise for a novel by Perumal Murugan named Punachi, the, Punachi, the oh, tale of yes. a black yes, goat. I, yes. I have read that one too, yes. That too I oh. use the Bangla and the Hindi version, uh, English and Hindi versions to translate into Bangla. So nice. yeah, th those are three. And I've just finished a book of poems which I translated from Hindi into Bangla. Tell us what you've been reading recently that you'd like to recommend. Right now, like many people in the world, I'm in the process of finishing Sally Rooney's intervention. Oh, 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 oh. You're in the process. So uh, yeah. can you give us a preliminary? Uh, yeah, thought? which I, 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 I enjoy. I'm enjoying it very much more than a third novel, Beautiful World, Where Are You? And I think one reason is that the characters or some of the characters are somewhat older now. Mm -hmm. And and I think I'm, I'm a little... Uh, it it gives me more pleasure reading reading about them. Uh, Interesting, more that. relatable. I'm a big Sally Rooney fan, and, so I'm... yeah, so am I. So am I. I, I wouldn't yeah. quite go as far as to say relatable yet, but at least I'm not getting uh, the same. I mean, you know, it was it was good to read about the young people. It was great. I love conversations with friends and then normal people, of course. It was good to read about them, but I want to wanted to see what she does with older characters. So I'm very oh, pleased. No. That's that that's what she's done. And it's a story of brothers and and she also does this thing so well of relationships where people just get closer and closer, but they can't quite meet. And and in my head, that's so much a metaphor for translation. You just get closer and closer, but eventually you can't quite meet because the languages at the end of the day are different languages and often from different cultural setups as well. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh my God. And so now are you going to translate them into Bangla? I wish. I wish I could. I mean, you know, the problem I think, though, is that those who want to read Sally Rooney in India will read her in English. There isn't really readership, a readership for her in other languages. So that That's was helpful. Great. Yeah. Great one. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to recommend a book named Stories of the True uh, by Jay Mohan. Um, Jay Mohan is a Tamil writer. It's, it's a fascinating journey through a kind of underbelly that is largely invisible to most of us. In India, you know, it's, we have many layers in which people live. And it's very easy for one layer to be virtually oblivious of another layer. Although, because their worlds don't intersect, uh, they, they don't meet one another, they have almost nothing to do with each other. Another Bengali writer named Manoranjan Bapadi also writes about similar people. And you've translated him, I'm quite sure, I've translated right? him, and so has a, a very fine translator named V. Ramaswamy, who's translated one of his mammoth autobiographical novels in three volumes, oh. uh, the third volume of which has just come out. And so uh, I, the translator of Stories of the True is Pri Priyambada? Priyambada, that's right. Priyambada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the first time I've ever heard of a one-name yeah. one well, translator. Well, well, you know, there's. I don't know if, if that's the case with her, but many people in that's India now abjure uh, their surnames in order to not make an issue of their caste identity. 
because the whole point is that you don't want to assert yourself as belonging to the so called upper castes since that's a signal of power and domination so i have i mean I, i'm not equating that motive with uh, with priyamvada's choice here but it is something that is beginning to happen in india and quite a fascinating thing it is too wow and this awareness is strong among young people which is wonderful when we got our names and surnames we didn't think about these things there's another book of short stories that's coming out by a kannada writer named banu mushtaq hot lamp selected stories did you have another one that you'd like to recommend well, or I'd, i'd like to talk about vivek shanbag's new book as well which will soon be published in the uk it's it called will. oh that's the best yeah. news i've heard all day yes, yes. i've been waiting for this yes please that's tell us about it oh my god Well, Sakina's case is a terrific novel. As with uh, Ghachar Gote, it is narrated by a man who is very uncertain of himself, and this man, on top of that, does not realize it. But he is a male chauvinist, but he thinks he is not, and he is also he lives his life in cliches, which also he is not aware of. And these cliches, uh, many of them arise from this from management jargon in a corporate world. I mean, he is forever living off self help books. but uh, his his wife and his daughter bring a very different version of the world to him which doesn't please him at all because they they challenge his what he imagines is his authority but he is not an assertive guy either so and all this is set out in the current socio political situation in india operates in a mild way it's it's not overtly in your face or anything and as with all of vivek's novels you know there's so much more that they say than the words actually Uh, represent so much of his novels reside in what you hear but don't read and and he's got this is it's it's just funny without him trying to be funny funny in the sense that he's got his people down so well that that you can't help but laugh translator to what well, it's translated by srinath perur yes as as gachar gochar yeah. was That's right. Okay, great. Oh, I uh, am stimulated beyond belief. This has been a wonderful conversation and it's been way too short. I would love to have you come back for a longer chat about translation or anything you'd like to talk about. <laughs> Anytime, Sean. Thank you so much. So, yes, all the way from Delhi, and I actually the buddy read I'm doing with Joe Smith of Kwabnama will be finished next week. So I'll have more to say but I don't think I'll be able to say anything as cogent about the book as what you just heard Arunava say if I've got that name pronounced right finally all right this week I have finished two books and I have one that I've started that I'm going to be checking in on and in terms of a booktube news I did get two videos up oh my zooming in discussion with Dorian Stuber about uh, protagonists and fictional narrators that don't have a name. Very erudite discussion thanks to him. And my pseudo buddy read chat with Alina, one of my uh, loyal subscribers and patrons about the colony by, by Audrey McGee is up. That one she liked quite a bit better than I did and it was a really great discussion. I guess I'm really hoping and maybe I need to actually test how much this noise is picking up because i might actually have to move all right well i um did a little uh, sound test and i think that uh, it's pretty minimal on the video so please bear with me the first one i finished i'm not going to talk about really at all i finished uh, late la late last night margaret lawrence's the stone angel her classic canadian novel from about 1970 six or something I'm not sure. This is for my Patreon book club. We're discussing it tomorrow and I'm not going to say anything here both because I haven't quite gelled with how I feel about it. I very much enjoyed it. I'm hovering somewhere between a 4 star and a 5 star feeling about it. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion tomorrow and I think that's going to help things gel for me. So I will say a little bit more if I remember next Friday and looking forward to that chat and uh, I I often say If you join today, you can join in the discussion of Margaret Lawrence tomorrow, but unless you've already read the book, that wouldn't work very well. You'd be a little bit pressed for time. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's done. And the one that I will talk about, but yet I'm constrained from talking about it too much for a very different reason is 
The Booker shortlisted The Safe Keep by... The Safe Keep, a novel, was written by Yael van der Wouden. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved it so much more than I thought I would. I talked about the opening premise before, and so I'll just give you a quick uh, reminder of that. Set in about 1960, not in Amsterdam, but in another Dutch city, and the 30-something single woman, she lives in the house that she grew up with when her family evacuated Amsterdam due to famine, I believe, and she has two single brothers, one who is gay, like, uh, that's not a spoiler, I don't think, and the other one who's a real ladies' man. And so they are dragged out for another sibling dinner at a restaurant to meet yet another of the straight brothers' girlfriends and our protagonist, Isa, or Isabel, can't stand her, just hates her immediately. And they clash, and the story goes from there. So that's all I'm going to say about it, other than to say there are... Oh, good, they're done. They're done. Oh, how lovely. I guess that guy is a teacher, and he thought maybe I was being kind of pedo, pe pedophile sitting here, talking in a, in a microphone with books. Back to peace and quiet. But just to um, reiterate, this is not a school park. This is a public park. The school is there, and they obviously use the playground equipment right beside me. Anyway, he was kind of friendly and kind of gruff with me. I didn't... Uh, didn't really enjoy that encounter. <laughs> anyway, I can't. There are there are a lot of twists and turns in the book. That's the only thing else I'm going to say that's remotely related to the plot. But the, the twists were so effectively crafted. They were so satisfying. And let's just say at least once, but really twice, the story becomes a completely different story and it was just masterfully done. I don't think it's necessarily a Booker book, but I could see a case being made for it to be a Booker book. If it won, I would be absolutely delighted. It's a debut novel written in, I'm assuming, the author's second language, but I don't know that. It's written in English, so I'm assuming Dutch is her native tongue. It's beautifully written, and I cannot recommend it more highly. It's also wonderful on audio, so I barely looked at the book. I just sank into the audiobook, and it's one that you can do that with. So that was a complete and utter delight. Now I'm ready to check in on the book that I'm reading to Mary Jean, Ivy's Tree, a Canadian novel by Wendy Burton, and it's her debut. And this is about, an, I think she's about 77, widow from Vancouver, who's, I think it's her only child, I'm pretty sure, unless I've forgotten about a sibling that hasn't been mentioned very much, but her only child who married a Japanese guy and lives in Tokyo. And the daughter convinces her to move, lock, stock, and barrel, sell her house. Her, she, her, she's been widowed for a couple years. Sell her house and move and live with them. So she does. Uh, despite the fact that like, I'm really dreading how this is going to work out because there's an extended scene of our protagonist, what is her name? Ivy. Ivy, hello, Ivy. And her, hus her husband, so it's a memory from, you know, five or ten years ago, when the daughter came to visit with her two boys, half Japanese, half Canadian. And the daughter seemed like a real spoilt brat, like she was 35 or something, but she just was really kind of acting out and being a real pain. And I'm just thinking, oh God, you're going to go live with her? Oh my God. <laughs> but I just have to say, 75 or something, 75 pages in, is that right? 86 pages in. I'm just rejoicing that I had, rejoicing in the fact that at least sometimes my intuition about a book and following my nose to a book that nobody's talking about, nobody's ever mentioned, passed me by when it came out because I wasn't living in Canada, is turning out to be such a delight. So, Wendy Burton herself, from her picture, she looks like she might be 65. And this is her first novel. And on her profile on the Writers' Union of Canada, she said she's got some other manuscripts ready to submit to a publisher if anybody's interested. And I, boy, I sure think that she should. So I find the writing, it's a joy to read aloud. The sentences are so well crafted. And they're uh, uh, reading to Mary Jean almost every night for six months or more. And I like reading aloud anyway. But you really get a sense of the shapeliness or misshapenness 
of prose when you read it out loud, and this is just lovely. If, if it continues to be as good as it started out, I shall be evangelizing about this book. Ivy's Tree by Wendy Burton, published in Saskatoon by Thistledown Press, the same publisher that has now put out the Guy Vander Haag essays. Wendy Burton, as far as I know, has never lived in Saskatchewan. She just happened to get it published here. She lives in BC. And I shall be evangelizing about this one evermore. All right, so my audiobook had been the safe keep. So I get to start a new audiobook, and I've decided at long last, Lindy, are you listening? To do a short story collection that Lindy has been raving about since it came out. Animal Person by Alexander McLeod. Probably do it as an audio text combo, or if it's one that I can sink into without the text, I shall do that. Lindy in, often puts these lovely little notes about why she's giving me the book or what she thought of the book. And she, she just loved this book and said that it was robbed of a literary award and that literary award is no longer mentionable on my channel, so I won't mention it, but it did, uh, I think, it was on shortlist or whatever. And he is the maritime writer Alistair MacLeod's son. It's supposed to be an amazing collection of short fiction. I'll be the judge of that. All right, well, that's my Friday Reads. How fabulous. Thank you very much for watching.